Hello, everyone. Um, well, I'm here recording this uh, video that you will use on Friday, February 3rd, when I will, will be out. <clears throat> so this uh, video is going to focus on the first three pages of topic 6.7 and 6.8. I hope that you can get through this during the class period. And if that is not the case, then the video will be linked. I will send it in an email. It will be posted on YouTube. So you need to come in on Monday having done um, all the all the examples in this video. Okay, so let's get started. These are two topics. 6.7 is the fundamental theorem of calculus and definite integrals. And then 6.8 is finding antiderivatives or integrals um, uh, and indefinite integrals. So some of the basic rules and notation. So let's get started. The first thing we want to do is Imagine that we want to find a function f of x, big f of x, and we know that its derivative is f of x equals 3x squared. So it's kind of like saying, what was the function big f such that the derivative turned out to be 3x squared? And Functions which end up in a coefficient with a variable to a power usually are functions whose derivative is done using the power rule. So then we know that when we take a derivative, the exponent will decrease by one. So that means that the exponent had to be three, right? So we know it's going to be x to the third. And it turns out that if we do the derivative of that function, x to the third, well, what would happen is the 3 comes down and multiplies the x, and the x is now decreased by 1 in the power. So then we can say that that would be the function capital F of x. And the reason is because um, F of x is the derivative of big F of x, and that would be 3x squared. Okay, we could explain it that way. Now, it turns out that that is not the only option that we could have. Um, any of the following examples would end up in the derivative of 3x squared. Now, if you think about it, we look at these examples here. Well, this derivative would be 3x squared plus 0 because the derivative of 1 is 0. Same thing with the second one. Big F prime of x would be 3x squared. And we could say minus 0, but it doesn't really matter. So then what happens is that if we have the same variable part, but then we're either adding or subtracting any constant, then the derivative is always going to be the same. So then this plus C is there because what this means is like a placeholder. This means that the original function could have had any constant. And its derivative, the derivative of the constant, is 0. OK? Now, um, the integration symbol, now talking about notation, is not new to us. We have already done it when we have found areas under a curve. Um, so instead of writing what function would have the derivative of f of x, what we write is the integral of f of x dx. And that is exactly how it's read, the integral of f of x with respect to x, which means that's the variable. So in general, we say that the integral of little f of x is big f of x. And we must always write a plus C after your integrals answer. So one thing to notice is that compared to the other integrals that we were doing before, this one has no limits of integration. It doesn't have any boundaries, any little numbers on that integral notation. And when an integral does not have those limits of integration, we're going to need the plus C at the end, and this is called an indefinite integral. OK? 
Okay, and that's an important um, difference that we need to understand about intervals. With the little numbers, we're gonna find an area and those are called definite integrals. Without the little numbers, we're not gonna find a numerical answer. We're not gonna find an area and we need the plus C at the end. So here are some of the basic integration rules. So the integral of zero is just a constant. Um, that doesn't come up that much. The integral of a constant multiplying dx by itself is k times x plus c. And I would say that there's kind of another one that we need to think about. The integral of only dx by itself is going to be x plus c. Because you want to think about this as a one Okay, there's a, an invisible one multiplying there, the dx, or like that's the function that is between the integral symbol and the dx. And we know that the derivative of x is one. Therefore, the integral or the antiderivative of one by itself is just x. Um, what rule number three says is that if we have a constant that is multiplying a function, then we can take that constant out of the integral and multiply the answer to the integral. Numbers four and five just mean that if you have an addition of two functions or more, or a subtraction, we can split the problem into as many integrals, okay? So if we have two functions that get split into two integrals that are adding or subtracting depending on what we had to begin with. And then we have the power rule for integrals, number six. Notice how n cannot be equal to negative 1, because if that was the case, and then we look at the formula, we would have a division by 0 right here, okay? And that is not possible. Now, we're going to see this formula in action in the next examples on the next page, in page 24. So here we go. All of these examples can be solved using the power rule for integrals. And I'm going to write the formula up here, just so that we have it um, close by. The integral of x to the nth power dx is one over n plus one times x to the n plus one plus c, okay? So let's take a look. Um, in problem A, the first thing we could do is take out that three because it's a constant and then leave x dx inside. And we can think about that x as having a power one. So because x to the one is an example of x to the nth power, we can use the power rule for integrals. This constant was just gonna sit there. And then we're gonna start by writing a parenthesis. That parenthesis is going to be for the one over n plus n, uh, over n plus one. But the first thing I'm gonna try to think of is the new power. The original power was one, and the formula here is telling me that I need to increase that power by one. So the new exponent is two. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the reciprocal of that new exponent in this parentheses. That's just a placeholder for that reciprocal. Um, two is the same as, as two over one, so the reciprocal is one over two. And then we could at the end just write three halves x squared plus c. Okay, you don't have to write the plus C in every single step, but just make sure that you do write it at the very end. Now, for problem B, if this was a derivative, then the first thing we would do is move that X cubed that's in the denominator up to the numerator. So that's exactly what we're going to do when we are integrating. This is X to the negative three. Now, remember that the only exception for this rule is that X cannot be equal. I'm sorry, I said X. It should be N n, the power, cannot be equal to negative 1. So this one works because the power is negative 3. Now, there isn't any constant that's multiplying, but I'm going to start with this parenthesis, which is my placeholder for the reciprocal. And I'm going to always start with the new power. The new power is going to be the old power increased by 1. So negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2. And the reciprocal would be 1, um, would be negative 1 half. And now what I can do is just clean this up. So I could say negative one 
over 2, and then that x with a negative power and it will now go down and become a positive power, and then don't forget the plus e at the end. Okay, there's the second one. Start getting a little bit more interesting as we go. Okay, now, problem C. If this was a derivative, we would turn that radical x into an x to the one half. So that's exactly what we're going to do. x to the one half dx. So my strong recommendation is always start with a parentheses, but then figure out the new power. That new power is going to be one half plus one, which is three halves. So then this new power is three halves and the reciprocal is two thirds. And that goes in the front. And we could go back to the radical notation. So this will be two thirds. And then the square root of x cubed plus c. Don't forget the plus c at the end. Okay. Now, this next one, if this was a derivative, we could think product rule because we see a multiplication. However, there is no such thing as a product rule for integrals. So what we're going to do first is we are going to turn that cube root into a power one third times x minus four. And notice that I'm not integrating yet. So I'm keeping the notation. I'm keeping the integral symbol. I'm keeping the dx. And I need to work with this before I can actually start using the power rule for integrals. Now, after that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to distribute into this parentheses. And remember that this x is to the power of 1. So then we're going to have the integral of x to the 4 thirds, right? Because 1 third plus 1 is the same thing as 1 third plus 3 thirds. And then we get that new exponent. Uh, when we multiply, we add the exponents. And then minus 4 x to the 1 third. This is after distributing. So we had to do a couple of steps to, just to get this ready. Now that it's ready, we can start applying the power rule for integrals where we do the parentheses, new power, reciprocal. And we need to do it twice because we have two terms inside of that integral. So here's my first placeholder. Now, my first new exponent is 4 thirds plus 1, which is the same thing as 4 thirds plus 3 thirds, or 7 thirds, and then 3 sevenths inside of the parentheses and the placeholder. Then we have a minus 4, right? So that 4 was already there. It's multiplying, so I can keep it out. Then I need my placeholder for the reciprocal, but I need to figure out my new power first. So the new power will be 1 third plus 1, which is the same thing as 1 third plus 3 thirds, or 4 thirds, and the reciprocal of that is 3 fourths. So we can see that those fourths will cancel out, which is pretty nice. Now we can go back to just like cleaning up and not forgetting the plus C at the end. So then what we have here is three sevenths, and then we have the cube root of X to the seventh minus three, and the cube root of X to the fourth, and then plus C. Okay, and I may remove that too quickly. But of course, you can always pause the video. Hey, technology. Um, and rewatch it if you need. Okay, so there it is, just to make sure that you have it down. Whoever is helping out um, on this beautiful Friday morning, um, if students require it and you need to pause, great. Um, but let's try to keep moving quickly. Okay. Now, um, this... If this was a derivative, then we would probably think about quotient rule, although there's another way to do it. But there's no quotient rule in integrals, unfortunately. But what we can do is we can work with this. So we have x plus 1. And I'm going to split this into two fractions. And not only that, I'm going to turn that radical x into x to the 1 half. And then I have this dx. Okay. Now I'm going to simplify. So this is like x to the one or two halves. 
So then when I subtract the powers, I'm going to end up with x to the positive one half. And then the second fraction, I can move that x to the one half, move it up and make it x to the negative one half. So now both terms are ready because they are x to a power and we can do the power rule for integrals. So for the first one, here's my placeholder, x. The new power is one half plus one, which is three halves and reciprocal two thirds. Plus placeholder, x. New power is negative one half plus one, which is positive one half. Reciprocal of that is two over one. I know I don't need to write the one, but that way we can see that it's a reciprocal. So now we can go back to radical notation. So two thirds, the square root of x cubed plus two square root of x plus c. And I'm thinking that maybe, did I forget the plus c in the other problem? In the last one? Hmm. No, I did not. That makes me happy. Okay, so there it is. I have not forgotten the plus C in any problem, and that is that is good. That's progress. Okay. Um, what I would say about problem F is that um, this, if this was a function that we were going to do the derivative for, then we could think chain rule, right? Because we have an outer function, which is something squared, and then we have the inner function, which is t squared plus one. There isn't exactly a chain rule for integrals. There's something kind of similar where we need to look for an inner and an outer function, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some algebra. We're going to expand. Now you can either FOIL, or if you know the, the shortcut, the rule, the formula, great, do that that way. Uh, but when we expand that t squared plus one, everything squared, we end up with t to the fourth plus 2t squared plus 1, dt. Now you can get that by multiplying t squared plus 1 times itself. Okay, every single term is ready for us to do the power rule for integrals. So the first one, placeholder, new power is 5, reciprocal is 1 fifth. Plus, we have a constant that we shouldn't forget. Then the placeholder, t to the new power is 3, right? Because that power 2 increased by 1. And then the reciprocal of that in the front. Plus, and then the integral of just 1 is going to be the variable, right? So the integral of 1, 1 dt, the integral would be t. So that means that we have 1 fifth t to the fifth plus 2 thirds t cubed plus t plus c. Okay. Okay, we're getting close to the end of this page. So yeah, this video is going to be a little bit long, but I just wanted to make sure that it was one video. And um, just for future reference, what I'm going to do is I'm going to timestamp um, like the pages, right? So take you to the first page, which was 22, then, or not 23, then 24 and so on. Okay, now this problem here is a little bit of a different take. Now, we need to remember that the integral of f double prime is f prime. The integral of f prime is f. And we want to find the function f of x. So what we're going to do is, first, remember that f prime is the integral of f double prime. Okay, because the derivative of f prime is f double prime. So if we want to get to f prime from f double prime, we need to integrate. We need to do the inverse operation. Now, what is f double prime of x? Well, it's given right here. So this can change and be the integral of 3 dx. And when we have a constant, we can take it out. But then the integral of dx is just x. So 3x plus c. So at this point, the function, not the function, but f prime of x is 3x plus c. But guess what? They gave me a point 
for the derivative. They gave me a value for the derivative. When f prime has two inside of it, the answer is five. So then we're gonna say f prime of something equals three times something plus c. Now, what is that something? It's two, right? Because that's what we know, they told me right there. Now, what is f prime of two? Well, f prime of two happens to be five. And then we have three times two, which is six plus c. Now, what does this mean? It means that we have six plus c equals five or c equals negative one, right? Because we would be subtracting six from both sides. So that means that now we know the specific value of c for the f prime of two equals five, right? So when the derivative at x equals two is five, we now have a specific value of c. So at this point, our f prime of x is three x minus one. Okay, so I'm gonna put that in a box just because that's like an important part of this problem here. Now we need to do the same thing to go from f prime to f. So f is going to be the integral of f prime of x dx, which in this case is the integral of 3x minus 1 dx. Okay, so we go from f double prime to f prime, figure out the c, then we go from f prime to f. Now, this is going to be 3 times a placeholder x. Now, what is the original power here? It's 1. So the new power is 2, and the reciprocal is 1 half. And then we have minus. Now, the integral of 1 is just x. So minus x plus c. Now, we have another piece of information here. And we know that the value of the function when x equals 2 is equal to 10. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say 3 halves of something squared minus something plus c. What this point tells me here is that when x equals 2, the entire function equals 10. And that means that I can now find the value of c. So let's see what we have. Um, 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12 divided by 2 is 6. So this first term is 6 minus 2 plus c equals 10. Now, if you do that math, you're going to get that c is equal to 6. Now we're going to go back to this version of the function, which had the plus c. But now we know a specific value of c, which in this case turned out to be 6. So finally, we get to our function, which is f of x equals 3 halves x squared. I'm looking at the yellow one, but now I have a specific value of c, minus x plus 6. Okay, that would be our final answer for this problem. Okay. Now, just like we had six trig functions um, or six formulas for the six, six derivative formulas for the six trig functions. There we go. Well, we also have six very specific integrals for trig functions. The integral of cosine is sine because, and of course, plus c, because you might recall from, I believe, unit four, that the derivative of sine is cosine. Then the integral of sine is negative cosine because the derivative of cosine, which is a reminder here, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Okay, and actually there's a little mistake here. Should have said plus C, sorry about that. Plus C, there we go, okay. Now, you might remember from the derivative formulas, and if not, it's a good time to, time to remember, the derivative of something is cosecant squared x. And that is 
the derivative of cotangent. But actually, the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant, which means that the integral of cosecant squared is negative cotangent x plus c. Okay, so I think it might be worth it to remember the like the, the derivative formulas. No? So the derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. I already put it there. The derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared of x. Right. So the ones I'm writing in red are the derivative formulas. And with those, we can see what the integration formulas will be. Um, this one here is tangent x plus c. And the reason being that the derivative of tangent is equal to secant squared. No sign change in this one. Okay, there's two more here. Um, this one will be negative cosecant x plus c. The reason is because the derivative of cosecant x is negative cosecant x cotangent x. And finally, the integral of secant x tangent x dx is tangent x plus c. And the reason is because the derivative of tangent x is secant x tangent x dx. And actually, I apologize, this is secant. Okay, I'm not going to go back and like re record the video. So this one is secant x plus c. And this one here is also secant x. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Now it is absolutely correct. Okay. So take a second just to make sure that you have that correct. I am checking with my notes and all of these formulas are correct. And once again, we were looking at these, right? So these are the ones that we need to learn now. But if we know what the derivative formulas are, then you know it might be easier to figure out what these integral formulas, um, what the answer to these integrals are. Okay, so um, we're gonna take a look at a couple of examples and some integrals or antiderivatives of exponential and another specific type of function, and then we're gonna call it a day, okay? If there's any time left on this very nice Friday, what I would say is that um, use the rest of the time to get work done, okay? Many of you were missing, um, missed the big deadline last Friday, so make sure that you are doing the work. Okay, so we have two problems here. The first one is pretty straightforward because since that two is a constant, we can absolutely take it out of the integral. And it turns out that there's a very specific formula for the integral of sine x. And if we go back to the previous page, the integral of sine x is negative cosecant, negative cosine x plus c. So this one is two times negative cosine x. And then of course we can just multiply and get negative two cosine x plus c. Now this one is a little bit more tricky. Well, because there is no formula in the six that we saw before that actually has like a fraction with trig functions in it. So we have to get a little bit creative and remember some of the basic trig um, identities. So first thing I can do is I can say that this is the same as sine over cosine, but of course there's cosine squared, which means there's two cosines in the denominator. So I can multiply by another fraction with a one on top. Okay. So if I went back, sine x times one is sine x and cosine x times cosine x is cosine squared x. So I just split it into two fractions that are multiplying. Now, why would I do that? Well, because it turns out that sine over cosine is tangent and one over cosine is secant. 
And there is a formula that says the integral of secant times tangent, and the order doesn't matter because it's a multiplication. So then we can actually apply that formula. When we go back to the previous page, there it is. The integral of secant times tangent is equal to secant. And of course, let's not forget the plus C. So this would be secant X plus C. Okay. Okay, um, just a couple more. Here's another very important integration formula or anti-differentiation, means the same thing. So first exponential functions. If we have an exponential function in which the base is e, so e to the x, and right now this formula is only for e to the x, okay? When the power is something different, we'll see that in, in a few days. Um, so. This one's really easy because the integral of e to the x is just e to the x. However, we can take out that five as a first step. And now we have exactly that formula, right? So the five was taken out, but it's constant. It's just gonna multiply the answer. So five e to the x plus c. And then this one, in all honesty, that kind of formula does not show up as much but it could, maybe in one problem. One thing I can guarantee is that there's going to be way more problems with, with e to the x than some other number to the x. So really, all we're going to do is apply the formula. In this case, our a, the base, is a 6. But other than that, the formula looks exactly the same. So anytime we see an a, it's going to be a 6 in our solution. So we have 1 over ln of whatever the base is, which in this case is 6, times a, which is the base, to the x plus c. And that's it. Okay, so yeah, sometimes it can be that easy. Now, the last formula we're going to see today is a very specific one, but this one is, is one that also shows up a lot. Um, and that is the integral of 1 over x. Now, you might remember that the derivative of ln x is 1 over x. So this is why the integral of 1 over x is ln x. Now, the reason there's an absolute value is because you cannot have ln or any log of a negative number. So then that's why we need to ensure that whatever's in place of the x is a positive number. So what could we do in this problem? Well, five, it doesn't look like it, but it can be, you can think about it as a five that's multipl multiplying one over x. Because we want to see this in our problem, right? We want to match it to the formula. And because that five is multiplying, we can take it out of the interval. So 5, and then the integral of 1 over x dx, which is exactly what we have in this new formula for the integral of 1 over x. So then we would have 5 times ln of the absolute value of x plus c. Okay, the integral of 1 over x, so like this, becomes ln of the absolute value of x, if that makes sense. Okay, that's where we're going to stop, page 25. Um, I hope that um, this made sense, that this was helpful, and that way on Monday we can continue working on some other problems in this topic. We will probably be able to get done with um, like the next two pages. I think it's possible, but between Monday and Tuesday we'll be done, and we will be right on track with, um, with this topic. Okay, we are doing great on time, um, it's important that you continue working on homework or that you start working on homework if you haven't done it already. It's kind of important. Um, yeah, so we should be good because we have uh, until Tuesday to work on this topic. Okay, I'll see you next time and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.